foreign companies are leaving China. Now Amazon has joined the trend. That's as Apple shifts iPad production from China to Vietnam. Is Shanghai easing lockdowns? Residents in one community enjoyed restricted freedom for just two days before getting ordered back inside. Chinese military planes get dangerously close to a Canadian aircraft on a United Nations mission. Canada says its patrol flight was forced to change course to avoid a collision. The world's largest war exercise is set to begin this month, with 26 countries participating. It's part of efforts to counter Chinese aggression. And millions of Chinese college graduates say they can't find jobs. The country's unemployment rate is getting serious, spurred on by extended lockdowns. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. More and more foreign companies are retreating from China. And U.S. e-shopping giant Amazon joined the trend Thursday. Here's more. Amazon stopped supplying Kindle devices to Chinese e-readers from Thursday. By June 2023, Kindle users in China won't be able to buy new e-books from Amazon, as it will close its Kindle e-bookstore there. The Kindle app will also be removed from Chinese app stores in 2024. By 2017, China had become Kindle's largest market, but the company was facing strong competition from domestic rivals like Huawei and Xiaomi. That competition left Kindle losing market shares. China has a massive customer base of digital book readers, both for listening to and reading books. The market totaled 500 million people and brought in $6 billion worth of revenue in 2021. Amazon said the decision has nothing to do with the regime's pressure or censorship. It stated the company was adjusting its operating focus and noted its other businesses remain in China. These include cross-border e-commerce, advertising and cloud services. Amazon worked for over a decade to win Beijing's support to expand its business in China, though it closed its China online store in 2019. More and more foreign companies have started moving or considering moving out of Chinese market largely because of harsh local lockdowns and economic pain under the pandemic. Of those leaving, Microsoft's LinkedIn, Yahoo, and Airbnb near the top. Airbnb says it will close its business in China by July. Apple is also scaling back business in China on the manufacturing side. Reports say it's shifting iPad production out of China to Vietnam. Initial volumes are expected to be small, but the move reveals the vulnerabilities in China's tech supply chain. More than 90 percent of Apple products are made in China. Lockdowns across Chinese cities intended to cut off the spread of the Chinese Communist Party or CCP virus, the infection that causes COVID-19. But weeks-long factory shutdowns hit supply chains hard. Other Western tech companies have also recently cut services in or retreated from China. Microsoft's LinkedIn, Yahoo and Airbnb are a few of them. News about Shanghai lifting its lockdown has spread around the world. But residents in the city say they're far from a full return to normal life. Let's take a look. Reopened for just two days, a residential compound in Shanghai is already facing another blockade. The neighborhood committee issued a notice explaining how someone in the community tested positive for COVID-19. The residents were required to get tested twice on both June 2nd and 3rd. Though continuous mass testing is far from the only thing locals are coping with, many people say they're suffering amid food shortages caused by the sudden community closures, adding that the order left them unprepared and didn't give them notice to stock up on essentials. According to the notice, all the shops nearby the community were ordered to close. Outside of the compound, the rest of Shanghai's citizens are living under varying levels of restrictions. The restaurants there are still closed for dine-in service and only offer takeout. Entertainment venues remain shuttered and some subway lines are out of service. The intermittent shutdowns in the city appear to have no end in sight. And after June 30th, residents will be expected to cover the cost of getting virus tested regularly, a sizable financial obligation for many. That's on top of dealing with long wait lines at testing locations. A resident in Shanghai is reporting a possible virus cover-up. He told us on Thursday that positive COVID-19 cases had been detected in recent days, both in his neighborhood and two other nearby neighborhoods. 
all three of those communities were soon put back under lockdown. But interestingly, local authorities' daily reports on the pandemic did not appear to mention the confirmed infections. Here's what he had to say. My community said two days ago that there were two positive cases here. Then I checked the pandemic release put out by Shanghai authorities, but there was no mention of our community. In the past days, the nearby community in the North Gate area has been closed again. The same thing as before happened. This was not included in the pandemic release shared by Shanghai authorities. Then there is another community on our right side, which was released from lockdown yesterday, but closed again today. Then I checked the official pandemic release. There is still nothing. This isn't the first time residents have drawn attention to potential cover-ups. In the past two years, residents from across China have told us similar stories, where they say Chinese authorities covered up or underreported positive cases and even deaths. Nominees for a federal investment board are citing against Chinese investment. President Biden's picks to serve on the Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board have agreed no investment in Chinese firms. That's according to a June 2nd announcement from Senator Marco Rubio. The four nominees also confirmed their belief in writing that Americans should not invest in any country that threatens U.S. national security. If confirmed by the Senate, the nominees will join the five-member board. Rubio previously put a hold on the nominations, but said that he has now removed that hold. Since 1984, billions of dollars have been invested in a thrift savings plan by federal workers. The thrift invests in Chinese stocks through a stock market index. The index includes various companies from different countries, and about 8% of those companies are from China. The fund administers $735 billion of retirement funding for over 6 million federal employees and service members. Last month, five Republican senators raised concerns about a proposed mutual fund that would include multiple Chinese firms or firms based in other countries that threaten U.S. national security. Texas company Anyplace MD is suing a China-based seller of COVID test kits. The U.S. company ordered antibody test kits manufactured in China, the only place they were available at the start of the pandemic in 2020. The kits arrived after months of delays but were never used. Initial testing by the company found the kits produced test results that were inaccurate. A spokesperson said the kits were hard to read and showed false positive results. The U.S. company is now suing the kits' China-based seller in hopes of recovering the losses. The company said they paid roughly $500,000 for 100,000 kits with about another $120,000 still owed. Chinese jets have endangered a Canadian military plane operating in Asia. That's what Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie said Thursday. The day before, the Canadian Armed Forces announced that the air crews in several Chinese aircraft were very clearly visible as they approached Canada's patrol plane in what Canada called an attempt to divert its own air patrol flight path. The armed forces went on to say the Canadian air crew had to quickly modify its own flight path in order to avoid a collision. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called China's behavior extremely troubling. He said that the Canadian government would raise this issue with Chinese officials. Canada says similar incidents have happened several times while the Canadian aircraft was deployed to Asia. That deployment was part of the effort to support the United Nations in sanctions on North Korea. The Canadian flights were tasked with observing any attempts from North Korea to avoid sanctions, like the transfer of banned commodities from ship to ship. Similar moves from the Chinese side have been reported several times in recent years. In 2017, Chinese flights confronted a U.S. aircraft, getting as close as 150 feet. In 2019, Chinese fighters flew over a Canadian warship, getting within just a thousand feet. The U.S. announced its 28th rim of the Pacific Exercises, or RIMPAC, on Tuesday. Held every other year, the 2022 RIMPAC event represents the world's largest war exercises. It's slated to begin at the end of June and last until early August. This year's version will include all four Quad nations, the U.S., Australia, India and Japan, plus five South China Sea countries. 
In total, the Honolulu and San Diego-based exercises will see militaries from 26 countries. The U.S. military said in a Tuesday statement that the countries will employ almost 40 surface ships, four submarines and 170 aircraft. Around 25,000 personnel will participate. The U.S. and other nations insist on a free and open Indo-Pacific. At the same time, China is expanding its reach in the region, including militarizing islands in the contested South China Sea. Three nations with competing maritime territory claims to China, the Philippines, Malaysia and Brunei, are among those taking part in RIMPAC 2022. According to the U.S. Navy, the exercises will include various drills, as well as counter-piracy operations, mine clearance operations, explosive ordnance disposal and diving and salvage operations. The U.S. Navy announcement says the exercises help to deter and defeat aggression by major powers across all domains and levels of conflict. The first RIMPAC exercise was held in 1971. This graduation season in China, millions of fresh graduates can't find a job. Many Chinese graduates are expected to decide to either join the workforce or continue their academic pursuits before the last day of school in June. Data from a Chinese job search website shows that as of May, the employment rates of graduates only reached 23 percent for men and just 10 percent for women. According to an official Chinese report, job competition for middle school English teachers or even school registration staff members is so high, one position can receive as many as three to four hundred applications. Even for positions with low starting salaries, job hunting hardships appear to have no end in sight. A survey shows that this year's college graduates will see an average monthly income of less than $950. And this isn't even the worst news for the new graduates. Many students and their families have complained about how schools use their new diplomas to threaten them, forcing them to sign false contracts with random companies. That pressure comes from top Chinese authorities. Premier Li Keqiang recently stated that the country's nationwide unemployment rate should be kept under 5.5% year-round. But as of March, that figure exceeded 5.8 percent. And that's not all. Research from one Chinese university showed that the unemployment rate broke 15 percent in 2020. Why the large difference between the two? It has to do with China's rural population. Totaling 36.11 percent of the country's total, work status for China's entire rural population was excluded from official statistics. It's commonly believed the unemployment rate in China's rural areas is far higher than in cities. On top of that, pandemic restrictions have made that situation even worse, with many migrant workers having lost their jobs. The problem has started gaining traction on Chinese social media. One parent's post sparked buzz online. He wrote about how his son is graduating this year, but 90% of his classmates haven't been able to find jobs. Despite that, the school advertises its graduates' employment rates. The post goes on to explain, the school forced the students to sign a triple-sided contract between the school, the company, and the student, adding that the students won't be given their diploma if they reject it. China's zero COVID-19 policy could tie into the problem as well. The strategy has dealt heavy blows to China's economy, including to retail businesses, manufacturing, and other enterprises. Shanghai is finally easing its lockdown after two months, but many other cities are still grappling with restrictions to varying degrees. That includes the capital, Beijing, and global manufacturing hub, Shenzhen. Britain, the U.S., and other countries called for an agency of the United Nations to set up a mission to probe alleged labor abuses in China's Xinjiang and urged Beijing to allow unfettered access. A community of the International Labor Organization, or ILO, is set to make a decision next week on whether to accept the mission request. It could shine a light on allegations that Uyghurs have been unlawfully detained, mistreated and forced to work. Britain's envoy asked for the trip to be conducted before the next major ILO conference in 2023. Australia, Canada and the European Union also voiced support. Thursday's meeting comes just days after the end of a trip by UN High Commissioner Michelle Bachelet to Xinjiang. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said in March that China continues to commit genocide and crimes against humanity against mostly Muslim Uyghurs in Xinjiang. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for more than a year. Here's what to look out for in our second half, a possible nuclear threat from North Korea. 
Is the country getting ready for its first nuclear test since 2017? The risk is putting the U.S. and its allies on high alert. China's third and most advanced aircraft carrier is about to be complete after construction started in 2018. And we answer a question from viewers who asked, what do we really know about Chinese submarine activities off the coasts of the U.S. and Australia? We asked an expert to break it down. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. Right now, get a two-month subscription for just $1. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer, and see you tomorrow. The 2022 NTD 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition will be held from September 29th to October 2nd at the Merkin Hall of Kaufman Music Center in New York City. The competition is honored to have specially invited vocalists with the world-renowned Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve on its panel of judges. The gold award is $10,000. For more information, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com.